turn to the second case on this morning's docket. That is case number 112824, State of Kansas v. Rizzo. Please the court. Sarah Ellen Johnson of the Capitol Appellate Defender Office appears today on behalf of uh, Mr. Rizzo. And Your Honor, I would like to request five minutes for rebuttal. Five minutes is granted. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we are here today uh, after Mr. Rizzo uh, was found guilty by the district court judge of felony murder um, and some additional counts. Um, and the question before this court today is the adequacy of Mr. Rizzo's uh, waiver of his jury trial right. And in fact, not just a jury trial right, but uh, the additional uh, procedures that would go even with a bench trial of presenting evidence and cross-examining witnesses um, and consideration of, of other legal issues that would come with a trial as opposed to the presentation of sort of a stipulation. Um, what occurred in this case is that the parties were loosely talking about how they wanted to proceed and a jury trial waiver was obtained from Mr. Rizzo before the parties had even agreed how they were proceeding with this trial. Um, so there was a great deal of confusion uh, in terms of what rights Mr. Rizzo was actually waiving, what uh, well, the trial- why wasn't, why wasn't that confusion taken care of with the written agreement to proceed to trial on stipulated facts? I understand that they didn't know whether they were going to have a bench trial um, with evidence or a bench trial on stipulated facts, but subsequently they came up with a, an agreement and they signed in writing what they were going to do. So why didn't that solve your confusion? Uh, my argument there is that that was not um, thoroughly discussed then with the district court, again, making sure that Mr. Rizzo understood what he was signing. Um, I thought the district court came off the bench, went down and talked to Mr. Rizzo about this written document and said, is that your signature on there? Did you get all that explained to you? Um, and you're saying that's not sufficient? That's, that is our argument, that, that the district court always has the burden of making sure that the defendant understands everything uh, when it comes to this kind of a waiver. And, and, so, and simply uh, looking at a document and saying, you understand all of this, is our argument is that is inadequate. So the inadequacy wasn't at uh, the waiver jury trial, you're saying the inadequacy was at the uh, uh, acceptance of the agreement to proceed on stipulated facts. I Right, I think they go uh, together. Um, I think that the district court considered the jury trial waived at the point uh, early on in the day, uh, you know, page 15 of the transcript where it was accepted. Um, that was what the district court considered to be the jury trial waiver. So we can, you're okay with us considering together both what was said with the waiver of jury trial and what was said when they, uh, the court accepted the written agreement to uh, proceed uh, on stipulated facts. Correct. Our argument is simply that uh, the district court always bears that burden of um, making sure that the defendant understands absolutely everything um, and simply uh, the, the confusion uh, throughout that day in terms of understanding exactly what he was giving up, uh, how this proceeding would affect his subsequent rights uh, to consideration, for example, on direct appeal, um, all of that taken together, uh, our argument is that that was inadequate. And, and that really is the sum and substance of our argument today. Um, I was not planning on discussing uh, separately the second issue in the brief, the uh, motion for departure. We would. Uh, submit that issue on the briefs unless this court has questions. Well, do I understand the facts correctly that uh, Mr. Rizzo actually had two murder convictions within a seven year period and he was 23 years old? If this is the second murder conviction, yes. He had a juvenile felony murder conviction on his record. And how does that present substantial and compelling uh, circumstances for a departure? Well, that in and of itself, of course, was not part of our uh, substantial and compelling uh, reasons for departure. Um, the reasons that were cited in the defense motion um, were, first and foremost, Mr. Rizzo's um, acceptance of responsibility in this particular case, uh, his desire to uh, make sure that um, 
the individuals in his car who could potentially have been treated as co-defendants that he made sure that everybody understood no they were not responsible for my actions that night they were telling me to stop um, and he took that responsibility on himself um, his mental health issues um, that he had a history of and also um, the fact that he was intoxicated that evening those were the bases cited for the departure were you going to address this morning the authority, if any, of the court to depart? Of this court? or of the, the district court. Oh, uh, there, there were, um, uh, besides the felony murder, there were additional uh, crimes uh, that he was sentenced on separately. He received a separate 89-month uh, sentence that was consecutive to the felony murder sentence, and that is where the district court had authority to depart. I understood an issue in this case was whether there was authority to depart from the murder. I believe that was discussed below. Um, I was not pressing that argument. Uh, there were the additional crimes that could have been departed from, and that was our my argument today. But are you oh. you're conceding that there's no authority, legal authority for departure Correct. on the crime? Okay. That's what I was. Yes, going I'm. To Yes, I'm sorry. I'm not pressing that because I can see that felony murder carries uh, a statutory sentence. All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank any, you, other, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, again, my name is Lance Gillette, an assistant district attorney on behalf of the state of Kansas. I will address the issues in the same order that opposing counsel did here today. And the bottom line is, I think uh, the defense counsel is attempting to mix a question here of whether or not the defendant knowingly and voluntarily waived his jury trial right, as opposed to whether he knowingly and voluntarily proceeded to a, tri a bench trial and stipulated facts. Um, the brief obviously presents the, the question and the issue of whether or not the defendant knowingly and voluntarily waived his jury trial right. It is well settled that a knowing and voluntary waiver of the jury trial right must be on the record. And here I think that the record amply supports that. Um, the district court went through an extensive uh, conversation with the defendant and uh, advised him of his right to a jury trial and many of the appurtenant rights that go along with it. Even after the fact, and I think that Justice Johnson was noting as well, there was a, an important subsequent agreement that was entered into here. Um, and that agreement uh, clearly reflects that the defendant himself, that which he knowingly and voluntarily, intelligently, freely waived his right to a jury trial. I he, think the question is, is, you know, we've said that the court has a responsibility to inform the defendant of his or her rights. And the written agreement does say that the uh, defendant informs the court of his choice not to testify, to waive confrontation, um, and, and other things of that regard. But the, the argument is the judge didn't verbalize those rights. And I, I, my response, I guess, would be a couple fold on that. Um, Number one, I don't believe that the defendant himself cites any authority that would require those specific exact things to be verbalized in order to accept a knowing and voluntary waiver of a jury trial right. In addition, the district court, as uh, Justice Johnson noted, did come off the bench and address this specifically personally with the defendant to make sure that he did understand everything that was going on here. Um, moreover, I think it's, it's also telling um, in this case as well that from the very beginning, Defense counsel explained on the record that his client never wanted a jury trial. Um, he was hoping to secure a plea, uh, was unable to do that. And he further explained that the defendant's choice to avoid a jury trial was explicitly made, understanding that he did not want to put the defendant's family, or yeah, did the victim's family, excuse me, through uh, a trial and having to listen to the testimony of how he had killed the wife and mother of this family. Um, I think that that is absolutely indicative of the defendant's knowing and voluntary waiver uh, of his jury trial right here. Um, any impertinent rights uh, that go along with that, again, I believe the record 
plainly supports his knowing and involuntary uh, waiver of those rights um, as the district court. Um, and I, if necessary, I think it, we can also compare the, uh, the document that the defendant entered and the soliloquy that the court went through with him. And there was a great deal of overlap uh, you know, as the court went through its long conversation with the defendant explaining just the ins and outs of how a jury trial worked and what he was giving up by not proceeding in that fashion. Um, and I think that the, a lot, there's a lot of overlap and that based on the record that's before this court, um, the defendant's jury trial waiver was knowing and voluntary. As a final point on that, and uh, just the, that the state's first issue that we pressed in our brief was that this issue is not properly before the court for the first time. Um, I, I understand based on some of the questions today that the court may disagree, um, that there may be at least potentially some objective confusion from the record. Uh, the state respectfully disagrees that this, and feels that this record um, expresses no confusion at all, that the defendant's knowing and voluntary waiver was his goal and was the outcome that, uh, that occurred here. So, Explain to me logistically how that happens. If a defendant on appeal says I wasn't properly informed of all my rights and you say well there was no objection at the district court level how is that defendant to know that he or she was not given all the rights they were supposed to be given because if they knew all their rights why would why would they have to have that advice from the court? You understand what I'm saying? How, as I think we said in Fry, how does the defendant know what the defendant doesn't know at the district court level? Right. Um, or is that simply a matter of uh, ineffective assistance of counsel claim? It could perhaps uh, be a foundation for ineffective assistance of counsel, but I think that the, that the, the main point is to answer your honor's question, how does the defendant know what he doesn't know? Well, at some point he learns it and he can raise that either on direct appeal or at the district court. And I believe that the appropriate uh, venue for raising such an issue under these circumstances is in the district court because this is a question of fact and would require evidence testimony. And the only way he could raise it in the district court after he's sentenced uh, is to how? Do a... a 1507 for ineffective assistance that, that was my question is that the only remedy for someone that got insufficient advice but his or her attorney didn't object to the at the time um, you have to do a 1507 is the only available remedy with with the understanding that with the court's hypothetical that if this issue would be, have been raised after sentencing I believe that 1507 is the appropriate remedy at that time because after the sentence was, was pronounced, the district court would have lost jurisdiction over the criminal case itself and the defendant's sentence. And that's really postured differently when you're doing an ineffective assistance of counsel versus a denial of a, a jury trial right. Uh, and I, I suppose I, I would ask for a little bit of clarification. I don't know in what way. I mean, he can assert that he didn't know about his jury trial right as a result of counsel's well, representation. There's a difference. There's a difference between a, uh, a denial of your constitutional right to effective assistance of counsel and your denial of your right to a jury trial. They uh, are intertwined here with your 1507. But you're basically saying the jury trial issue is just not appealable. You can only appeal it through the vehicle of calling that ineffective assistance of counsel. And why doesn't that dilute that jury trial right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one. Why part. doesn't it, that dilute the jury trial right or at least eliminate it as the primary um, complaint if you, have to, if you have to call it ineffective assistance? I, I suppose I, you know, I don't know that he, I don't believe it dilutes the, the, the defendant's knowing and voluntary waiver of a jury trial, right? That he would have to present a claim trying to claim ineffective assistance. He could also just, he could also make a claim that, uh, so that he simply did not understand this critical constitutional right. But in a circumstance such as this, when that is flatly refuted by the record, I think no remedy ultimately is the appropriate outcome. 
And so I think it's at some level, once a knowing and voluntary waiver has been made and entered and the record plainly supports it, that we live with that. We move on with that decision. It's a decision that the defendant made with the advice of counsel after being, being advised by the district court. Uh, that decision is final. Fin uh, as a final point today, just to touch on, on the departure, um, I believe that the briefs, again, depicted this more as a question of whether we could depart on murder, and uh, the state would accept the opposing counsel's concession today that there is no statutory authority to, de to enter a departure sentence for felony murder. I believe we briefed that and addressed that. Um, then in regards to the other crimes, uh, the only thing I would point out there is that the district court here uh, in, did enter an alternative finding. It actually appeared from the record in this case that the district court uh, contemplated the potential authority to depart even up to and including the murder, the murder charge. And here, the district court denied the defendant's departure request after taking a recess, then coming back on the record laying out its method of consideration, uh, considering all of the letters that it had received, its personal observations of the defendant himself, uh, the defendant's age, the facts of the, uh, of, this in, of the instant case, as well as defendant's past, which in, does include a, a murder conviction as a juvenile, um, and then subsequently denied the departure request. And I believe on those facts that um, no reasonable per person could doubt that the district court's uh, denial of, de of a departure request here was a proper exercise of its discretion. If there are no additional questions on the he issue. He was the recipient of, uh, of a lower um, or criminal history as a result of, a, uh, of the stipulated facts, right? He, Correct. It went from a D to a, it could have been a criminal history B, but that charge was dismissed as a result of the stipulation. Is That's that right correct. also. So, a separate case was dismissed as a result. So he, he received the benefit of the whatever bargain there was as a result of entering the stipulated trial and the stipulated facts. Yes, absolutely. He did and, receive that benefit. Okay. And just, I guess, a final point on that is that it, it, it just strikes uh, in reading the transcripts here that, in, that what we faced here with Mr. Rizzo was initially a defendant that actually did express some, some serious remorse for his having killed this woman. Um, but it seems as though as soon as the jail door closed behind him, he regretted that decision. And at that point, I don't think that it's appropriate to then go back and consider everything that had gone before that was knowingly and voluntarily done. So if there are no additional questions. More questions. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Unless this court has additional questions, I would waive rebuttal. Any questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement. We now